So first of all, um, some of you might not even be familiar with what really cleaner fish are. So cleaner fish are uh, fish that have a symbiotic behavior where they eat uh, the parasites or dead skin that's on the outside of, for example, larger fish. So you might have seen on National Geographic who they go in and they clean the teeth of the sharks. You might have been to a spa where they eat the dead skin off your feet. So all of this is different types of cleaner fish. Um, and we also do have cleaner fish here uh, in Scandinavia. And it was in the late 1980s, it was also discovered that you could use some of these species to clean fish in aquaculture. So in aquaculture, especially salmon farms, you have really big issues when it comes to parasites. And that's the ones you can see in the picture here. So these are the salmon lice. Um, and they're a really big issue. Um, as you know, with many different types of farming, you keep a lot of animals in a relatively small space. So that means that if you do get some kind of disease or infestation coming into the farm, they can spread really quickly and they can both become a really big hazard for the health of the fish themselves, of course, um, but they're also a really big financial loss for the farmers because they can't sell this fish if this happens. So because of that, there is a lot of different types of tools and methods that are being used for cleaning cleaner fish, uh, or cleaning salmon. Um, so anything from antibiotics, different kinds of chemicals, even lasers, as well as cleaner fish, though. Um, so even though it was discovered in 1980, it wasn't really used much until quite recently. Elegant? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, um, uh, um, interrupt you, but your slide is stuck on uh, presenter view. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Let me swap displays. Does that work better? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So maybe just uh, reshare. Um, I can try and do this and just unplug that one. And we'll try this. So yeah. Perfect. Great. Perfect. Sorry, I couldn't see any of the chat, so I'm guessing something popped up there. <laughs> um, okay, so um, so the use of cleaner fish has increased a lot in recent years, uh, especially since around 2010, when some parasites started becoming more resistant to various types of chemicals or pharmaceuticals were also being banned from being used just because they were harmful for the environment. Um, so because of that, cleaner fish has become like slowly more and more uh, interesting and popular to use. And it went from around 1.7 million in 2008 to around 61 million in 2019, cleaner fish that were put into Norwegian salmon farms alone. So that's the fish that were put in that year. So it's not like the cumulative effect or anything like that. Um, and also cleaner fish also being used in other countries, for example, Scotland and Canada as well. Uh, but I would say Norway is still the leader uh, of this industry. And it's not only the number of fish that became more, uh, also just the value of these fish has increased exponentially, really. Um, so it really is a big interest in using these fish, because even though they are technically expensive, they are cheaper than many other methods. So these are the actual fish I'm talking about. So these are the four most common fish that are being used as cleaner fish in Norwegian aquaculture. So you have three different species of wrasse. So the ballon wrasse, the cork ring wrasse, and the gold semi wrasse. Um, my target focus has been mainly the cork ring wrasse, but I've also done some research on the other species and I'm quite familiar if we wanna have more discussions on those later. Um, and lastly, it's also the lump fish or lump sucker as it's also called. In Swedish, it's called stenbit. So you might be familiar with the roe. So it's actually also being caught for the roe uh, that you eat. And uh, these different species of fish, especially the wrasse, they actually were not commercially that interesting prior to this. So they weren't really used as food fish, so there really wasn't a fishery. And there are some challenges with using uh, cleaner fish in aquaculture today, uh, especially to sustainability. Um, the first one could be spreading of new diseases. So removing fish for aquaculture and translocating them and putting them in different uh, ways so that could actually facilitate the spread of new disease. It can also change the population genetics, so it can change the genetics of local populations if we move them in different ways. There can also be depletion of stocks, so if you have too much fishing pressure in certain areas, that can then resu result in stock depletion and um, to the point where the population might not be able to recover. 
There's also very high mortality. Um, so the mortality has been estimated to be anything between 40 to 100 percent of cleaner fish, which is incredibly high in comparison to salmon, where much, much lower rates are required. And finally, you can also just have irreversible indirect impacts of any of these, especially one, two, and three, on ecosystems that are surrounding them that we might not even be able to predict. Um, my focus has been mainly on these, so on the parts of population genetics and also on uh, fishery and stock depletion. And I kind of that's been my main target of research and what we'll mainly be talking about today. Which also leads me straight to the sustainability goals um, that I think are mainly the most relevant for this topic. Although I do think I could connect even more, I think the sustainability goal number two and 14 are definitely the, by far the most relevant, especially in terms of sustainable food protection and maintaining ecosystems that have the capacity to uh, adapt, adapt to future environments. So, so first of all, some of you might not be familiar, so why, why do we have to think about genetics when we talk about fishery? Well, the reason is why is because you have a population and you can have a large diversity, both in size and behavior, but also genetic. And if you have increased fishing pressure on one stock or one population, <clears throat> especially if you target a certain size or a certain trait, um, you can lose some of this diversity. What's more, is that if the populations are isolated and you have very high fishing pressure in a certain area, especially if this population is small, that can increase this depletion even more. And these populations will then be a lot less resilient for the future climate change and also less likely to be able to adapt to a different environment. So there's been some previous study already before on fishing pressure. Um, so RAS are very, very local, and there has been some surveys in Norway where they've shown that the RAS inside marine protected areas are larger, older, and also more abundant compared to outside, suggesting that we can already see some effect of fishing pressure despite it being such an incredibly young fishery. And tagging experiments, so where they put small tags on these fish, has also shown that a lot of them are actually being caught, and often also very close to where they were uh, tagged. So they are very, very local. Um, another aspect is that they also have really interesting and quite complex reproductive strategies. So several species of rest are sequential hermaphrodites, so meaning that they actually change sex. Some of them, they kind of mimic females and sneak in different ways. Um, and also they have very, very differences, large differences when it comes to size between sexes and different strategies. So that means that if we target, for example, only a certain size of a fish, we might only catch the males, which of course is a really, really big issue for the populations. So we wanted to kind of dig into this a bit more. So we've already seen that the genetics is also really, really important. So for Balan ras and Corkwing ras, we know that there is a genetic break just on the southwestern coast of Norway. So a genetic break means that the population, which is on the south of this genetic break versus the ones that are north of this genetic break, are very, very different. In fact, it's actually been estimated that they've been isolated for over 10,000 years and that they're only now meeting in a secondary contact zone. So these populations might have adapted to very different environment and have different behaviors and life history. So maybe you can't see that they look physically different when you look at the fish, but you can tell based on the genetic that they are very different. When it comes to the gold semi ras, we don't see the same kind of genetic break. Um, but what we do see is what we call isolation by distance. And that means that populations uh, or stocks which are closer to each other are more similar, but the further away you go, the more different they are. So the ones in the further south will be the most different from the ones in the furthest north. So the larger the distance, the more different they are. And this is a very common pattern in general when it comes to, genet to genetics. So then we really wanted to investigate that can we also see the same effects of vast fish on the Swedish West Coast? This has already been kind of shown on some parts of the Norwegian coast. Um, what is also the RAS's role in the trophic food web? So if we do fish these out, but what kind of consequences could that have? Like, what is it that they eat? Um, and is there any population structure within especially southern Scandinavia? Because we know there is this genetic break, 
but the different fisheries are managed differently depending on country. So Sweden, Norway, and Denmark do not all have the same rules for when they start their fishery and how much is allowed to be caught, etc. So we kind of really want to dig into if Southern Scandinavia can be managed as one or several units when it comes to the fishing of these different species. So first of all, we did a survey similar to the one in Norway where we looked inside and outside fished and fish, non-fished areas. Um, and we compared the three different wrasse species as well as some samples of algae and potentially consequences on the ecosystem. Um, but we really didn't see any effects yet, which is also not so surprising. So we could not see any stock depletions or size differences, but the fisher in Sweden is also a lot smaller. So I would consider this more to be maybe a baseline for future management, especially if we do increase this fishery in some aspect. And the second part was also looking at the what they eat. Uh, and in general, what we found is they eat a lot and they eat many different things. Uh, mostly they eat different kinds of uh, anthropods and insects, but also quite a bit of seaweed, which was quite surprising. Um, but in general, they seem to be kind of opportunistic in what they feed on. But this was just a very basic study, so we didn't distinguish with, for example, smaller or larger fish, which of course will be eating different things. Um, so that would be really interesting to kind of dig into in the future. And when it comes to population structure, we sampled a lot of different um, fish from different locations in Scandinavia, also as a reference outside. But we were mainly really interested in this area in this study here. So we really wanted to know, can we find any kinds of pattern of isolation by distance? Are there any differences if the fish is from Kiel or if it's from Gothenburg or if it's from Oslo? Are there any kind of populations that might need preserving in a certain way? Or anything like that. But here we really find very little population structure. Um, so we couldn't find that, you know, the fish that you get on the Swedish coast is different from the Norwegian. Um, so as a fisherman also told me, the fish does not know if it's Norwegian or Swedish. Uh, it might know if it's from the south of Norway or the north of Norway, but it will not be able to distinguish Sweden and Norway or the south coast. Um, and this is likely a combination of its colonization history, uh, but also that there could be some kind of ongoing gene flow that they have right now. So meaning that they actually do migrate in some way, maybe in their larval stage, for example. So, and then there is a second part. Um, so first it was the fishery, but another aspect is also the translocation. So what you see here is a map and the three different species of wrasse and their northern distribution limit. So this is the black line. So you can't really find these species further north than where this black line is located. And what you also see on this map is a lot of black dots. And each one of these black dots is the aquaculture facility. And um, so as you can see, there's a lot more facilities further north compared to where you find these fish locally. So that means that there is actually millions of wrasse which have been translocated for very large distances every single year. And this is also why we were especially interested in looking at the population structure and the fishery in southern Scandinavia, despite there being very few aquaculture facilities there, is because they're being caught there and then transported. And here is also the genetic break, as I mentioned earlier. And this is generally what an aquaculture farm looks like or a salmon farm looks like. So it's uh, big nets out in the open ocean uh, and they're meant for salmon, which means that the holes are relatively large still and the cleaner fish are a lot smaller. So if they were to escape, they could then have different kind of in, um, impacts on the local ecosystem. Um, so if they have uh, local populations, they could mix with them and introduce genetic material, which might be not as well adapted for the environment they're in. And um, also different populations, even if it's the same species, can have different ways that they behave, different things that they eat. And um, so they can still become kind of a novel impact on the environment and the ecosystem that they enter. So here we really wanted to figure out, do cleaner fish escape? Can they reproduce for local populations? How common are escapees? And is it possible to use genetic tools to kind of detect and monitor these cleaner fish escaping? 
So again, we went out and we took a lot of different samples. Um, so 22 locations, and we wanted to mainly target north of this genetic break where we know that they're being translocated to. Um, as in the south coast, um, there really aren't that many aquaculture facilities. So we have highlighted them in pink, south of the genetic break, and then blue, north of the genetic break. And then we developed a set of uh, genetic markers. So it's just 84 of these small markers, which are small spots along the genome. And we can use these to kind of just any fish and we can check how much its origin is from south of the genetic break and north of the genetic break. And then we did a lot of analyses. Um, so here, I'm going to try and explain this figure. It's a bar plot. It goes from north to south, so left to right. And each bar is one individual fish. And the color of every bar is the proportion of that fish or the probability of that fish to belong to one of the two different uh, populations. So you can see here in the south that all the individuals are very much pink because this is their genetic origin. Um, and as we go further north here, it's still quite blue. There's a little bit of pink just, just by the genetic break, but not very much. And then we kind of hit this area right up here in the furthest north. And this is actually all from the very northern part of this species distribution limit. So you can't really find it much further north. And here we found that around 20% of all the individuals that we sampled here had um, some degree of origin from the south coast. Um, and we kind of did a cutoff. So generally trying to find ones who are direct escapees or a first or maybe a second generation hybrid. So mixing between the two different populations. So meaning that they can also reproduce with the local population. So they're not that different that they can't have uh, reproduction, um, but they are still genetically so different that we very easily can detect them. And uh, now I'm gonna kind of leave the RAS a little bit and go on to the lumpfish. Uh, which is very, very different. It's actually a transatlantic species, so you can find it all across the Atlantic. Uh, it's also become the most commonly used cleaner fish. So it was not discovered in the 80s. I think it was maybe 2010 or 14 that it was discovered that you could also use this species as a cleaner fish in aquaculture. And since, since then, around 60 to 70 percent of all cleaner fish in Norway is now lumpfish. And actually, majority of the slum fish is also farmed. Um, and by farmed, that means that they're raised in captivity. But the farming process is still not a fully closed cycle, which means that they actually still have to go out and catch wild fish and use them as brood stock to get the eggs and sperm and then fertilize that in captivity. And then they raise them up and put them into salmon farms. Um, and here again, we have the same kind of questionings, you know, how, where did the brood stock come from? Are they genetically different compared to where you put the salmon in or put the lumpfish in? Uh, and also if there's trading with brood stock between different regions and different countries, population structure is really, really important. So here we really wanted to dig in, and first of all, of course, the global population structure, but with a specific target then on Scandinavia because that's really like the interest area that we have, especially given that Norway is one of the biggest producers and users of lumpfish. Um, but lumpfish is also being farmed and produced in, for example, Scotland and Canada. So uh, here we sampled uh, a lot of different areas. Again, as you can see, we kind of really targeted Scandinavia. Um, because we really want to see if there's any type of local population. So it's already known from before, for example, that in the Baltic, there's a very different type of lumpfish. So genetically, it's very different, uh, but it's also very different um, morphologically and life history. So they're a lot smaller, for example, than the lumpfish that you find out in uh, the North Sea or the open ocean. And here... It's a map by trying to describe the larger geographic patterns. Um, so we thought that we would not find so many large differences between this fish because it really does go out into the open ocean and lives in like the pelagic. Uh, but it does seem that it might actually return quite a lot to the same area, which is why we can still see a lot of population structure. So here I've highlighted the different main populations by color. 
So for example, you can have this green uh, population here in North America and Canada, this kind of yellow one in Greenland, this blue one in Iceland, uh, and so on. And there were some of these aspects that were specifically interesting. So first of all, we found here in the Fjord of Svalbard, which we thought would be genetically more similar to other Norwegian samples, was actually much more closer to the Greenland population, which could be a historic pattern. And this is something we want to investigate more if other fjords might have similar things. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the Baltic Sea is very different, but what we didn't know before was that we also seem to have a very localized population just off the coast of Sweden, so on the west coast, uh, so in the Skagrak and Kattegat region, so in this transition zone between the Baltic and the North Sea, it does seem that the population here is also genetically different from what you find outside in the North Sea. And then finally, this uh, little patch right here. So we had three fjords in Norway where the they were very close and very similar to each other, but very different from other North Sea samples. Um, so this is something we really want to investigate what this could be a result of. It's hard to say whether this is uh, already a result of escapees simply because we don't have a very good baseline to kind of work from. Um, so that's also what we're hoping that this can provide. And when we look further into these larger geographic patterns uh, of populations that we found, we found even more structure. I will not go into all the details, but just as an example, you can see Iceland up here, that if you look, you can see that the uh, samples that are from the west of Iceland are different from the ones that are north or east of Iceland. Or for example, here in Greenland, that you have kind of a, a south-north difference or uh, isolation by distance potentially in this population. Um, so this takes me a bit to my take home message from uh, my thesis, I guess, and also this talk. Um, first of all, is the clean of fish display a really high degree of population structure? And this is true for all different species, but in different ways. And um, so you cannot manage all of them necessarily always the same way because they don't all have the same life history and they also don't have the same degree or population differences. The second part is the cleaner fish can also escape and they can mix the local populations. Um, and this is really important because I do think that this really leads to that we really should avoid moving cleaner fish across these known genetic barriers that we now are very aware of, but we're still moving fish across them. Um, so it's better to use fish that are local, or and if you can't use local fish, then at least use a fish that is genetically very similar to the fish that you have locally around the farms. And in the cases where, you know, we're not able to not use fish from uh, another area and crossing these kind of genetic barriers, then there are some things that personally I think would be really important that we need to do that is not always done yet. Uh, first of all, is track source and destination. So currently, uh, imported fish from Denmark and Sweden to Norway is being tracked. So we know where the fish comes from. We know which farms ends up in. This is since 2017. Uh, however, this is not the case within Norway. So there we still don't know how much fish comes from the south coast of Norway and ends up somewhere along the uh, northern parts of Norway. And the second part is that there should also be preventative measures against escapees. This is something that there's a lot of research going into and a lot of management in when it comes to salmon to avoid that salmon escape and reproduce with local populations. But this is something that is still lacking when it comes to cleaner fish. And finally, um, genetic barriers and national borders do generally not align. And because of that, transnational management is incredibly important for management uh, of these kind of fish species, especially when there also is a lot of translocation involved. And finally, if you would like to know more, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, you can also find both my thesis online and also this really extensive report uh, that came out at the end of last year. Uh, it was me and many different researchers from a lot of different countries who try to collect information on all the different species and what is known and what are the biggest issues and challenges we have today for sustainability when it comes to both the fishery and the use of cleaner fish. So feel free to take a screenshot of that if you're interested. 
And other than that, a really big thank you for all of you two listening and all the incredible collaborators who have been part of uh, all of this research. So thank you.